What's going on? Welcome back to the channel. Today we are talking about progressive overload. It's a very common term. A lot of people have heard of it, but they don't know what it means. Someone recently asked me on Instagram, which by the way, if you don't follow me, you can do that here. What is progressive overload? Why is it important and how do you use it? That's what we're talking about in this video. So by the end of this video, you will fully understand what progressive overload is, what progressive overload is, why it's important and how to use it so you can get stronger, build more muscle and have better overall training. Let's get into it. All right, so what we're doing today is more self-defense. A couple days a month, just try and work on self-defense as opposed to just sport jujitsu. If something happens, God forbid, on the street, how to defend yourself. And since we train jujitsu every day, if something happens on the street, I still want to do jujitsu. But the thing about jujitsu is it takes place on the ground. So a lot of what we do is trying to close the distance between someone who might be attacking you, trying to punch. If you're gonna get in a fight, odds are you're gonna get hit. There's gonna, but you wanna protect yourself as much as possible. So being able to protect yourself, get in close, maybe trying to keep the distance a little bit and then get in, so then I can work my game, work my jujitsu, take it to the ground. That's what we're working on today. Alright, training is done. A lot of self-defense as you saw. If you have questions about jujitsu, leave them in the comments. I would love to answer if you're thinking about trying or maybe putting your kids into it. I think that would be amazing. Anyway, I'm starving. I'm gonna go back to the apartment, get something to eat, and say hello to the wife and my baby. Alright, so we were talking about progress. No, I'm not gonna start with that. Okay. Actually, I should have started with that. Okay, here we go. We might just keep all of this in to introduce the video at the, at the very yeah. beginning. <laughs> all right, we're talking about progressive overload, right? We're going to keep all that in. And before we get into the science and the nerdy stuff, uh, I just want to talk about a story about a man named Milo. Milo of Croton, I believe I'm saying the city properly. Um, the story goes like this. There was a very strong man. His name is Milo. He was an elite wrestler, amazing, amazing athlete and super strong guy. And the way he got strong is by, first he came down and he found a calf, right? Like a, you know, a baby bull. And he picked the calf up and he walked with it. And he did this every single day. Every single day, he'd pick the calf up, put it on his back, and walk with it and get stronger and stronger. But what would happen is as the calf grew and grew and grew, he did this for four years. So over the course of four years, every day, he'd pick the calf up and walk, and then it went from a calf to a bigger calf, and then eventually, over four years, became a bull. And every single day, he would pick up the calf and put it on his back. And this sort of very basically shows you progressive overload, how every day he's carrying this calf that then grows up into a bigger bull. And as the bull gets bigger, Milo gets stronger as a result of it because he can progressively overload. He, he's putting more and more weight on himself every day. And as the bull gets bigger, he can get stronger and bigger to carry that bull up the mountain every single day. Did that for four years and that's how he got stronger. So. I like the story and I don't like the story. I like it because it very basically shows you that in order to get stronger, in order to build muscle, you have to be progressively overloading. You have to be lifting more weight in some capacity. I don't like this because it oversimplifies it too much. Number one is you shouldn't be lifting weights every day, right? In the same way that Milo lifted this calf in, into a bull for four years every single day. It's like, that's not realistic. You shouldn't be lifting super, super heavy every single day. The other aspect is you're not gonna be able to get stronger and lift heavier every single day. It's a nice story and it's a great way to, to show how progressive overload works, but if the calf is growing daily, weekly, monthly, like there's a point where genetically you're not gonna be able to lift more. Like that point will exist. I don't know any human that could pick up a fully grown bull and walk with it like up a mountain. I just don't know if that's possible. And there also, 
you're not gonna be able to be the same strength every day, and you're not gonna be able to increase strength every single day or even every single week or even every single month as you get stronger and stronger and stronger, even if you're taking anabolic steroids. So it's important to keep that in mind. Progressive overload doesn't just go like this. In the same way weight loss doesn't go down like this, strength gain doesn't just go up like this. It fluctuates over time, and you can watch the trend line as you go. You'll get stronger and stronger and stronger, but you'll have dips and valleys and peaks and all of that stuff throughout the process. So that's important to keep in mind. So to simplify progressive overload, it's just a fancy way of saying that over time, you are going to progressively put your body under more stress so that your body is forced to adapt to better handle that stress, right? So if you're progressively adding more weight over time, over a sustained period of time, you're lifting more weight, what adaptations is your body going to have? Well, your muscles might grow, your muscles will be able to produce more force so you can lift more weight. Your tendons and ligaments will be able to handle that weight better so you're not gonna just rip them off the bone. There are a lot of adaptations, not just strength and, and muscular, but also neural adaptations that are happening. Your brain is sending more signals to your muscles to fire more quickly to, and fire more explosively and more powerfully. So when you progressively overload properly, what's happening is you are adding more stress to your body and there are many ways to add this stress adding more weight is one way, and we'll talk about all these different ways you can do it, but you add more stress to your body so that your body can adapt and then get stronger and build more muscle and be more athletic and all of that. And this applies to strength training, it applies to cardio conditioning, it applies to flexibility and mobility, it applies to really everything in life, like even outside of physical and, and sports. Like you could talk about progressive overload in terms of building a business, right? When you first start a business, like it's just you. And then you build and you build and you build and you can't until you can't do any more. And then, it will, okay, cool. So if I want to take on more stress, maybe I have to hire someone else. So now hiring someone else allows you to take on more stress. The business adapts, you grow, you improve, and maybe you hire someone else, right? And then, okay, cool. So we have enough. We have a team. We want we want to progressively overload more. So maybe we start paying for advertising so we can take on more people. It's like. Progressive overload is a strategy for life. It's not just for strength training and nutrition and all of that. It's for everything, but it you can really see it play out with strength training because you're adding more weight. And as you lift heavier weight, you're getting stronger, your body adapts. Progressive overload, very simple. You add more stress to your body so your body can adapt and then get better and stronger and improve from there. Now, like I said, down here in the how-to portion, we're gonna talk about different ways to progressively overload, but one thing I wanna talk about in terms of progressive overload is how when I see people on Instagram talking about how you're supposed to be lifting weights in order to really progressively overload and get stronger and build muscle, a lot of what I see is people like working until failure and like going crazy and lifting super heavy and there's a time and a place for that and it is very important in the right population. But when I see a ton of people who are just starting out in the gym and just beginning their fitness and strength journey, when they see someone being like, you, your last few reps need to be like this, it doesn't at all, especially for a beginner, for many, many reasons, not least of which, a beginner, when you first walk into the gym, within your first year, year and a half of training, anything you do is putting a new stressor on your body, anything. Even lifting up 10 pounds repeatedly over and over again is new to you because you haven't done that before. And what the research shows us is that beginners, someone who's within the first year, year and a half, whether it's day one or day 60 or whatever it is, you can get stronger with as little as 40% of your one rep max. So I'm not a numbers guy, but let's just make this really simple. Let's just say the most amount of weight that you can lift in a curl, which would actually be a lot, is 100 pounds, right? Let's just say the most you can do is 100 pounds. For, for one rep. That would mean that you can take 40 pounds and just rep that out and you'd still get stronger with that. You would get, without having to be like this, you could do 40 pounds for six, eight, 10 reps and you would get stronger. You would make adaptations with that light amount of weight because you are brand new to the gym and any stimulus is going to cause that adaptation that's gonna cause you to get stronger. So if you're a beginner, you do not need to be doing like the shaking and like the super, super heavy and going until failure. One, because you don't need to, and two, because your technique isn't gonna be good. You're a beginner, like your technique is, I've never seen a beginner walk in and have every technique be great. Also, not to mention, and this is super overlooked, when you're training, you're not just training your muscles. 
your tendons and your ligaments are being trained as well. One of the most common reasons I see people getting injured in the gym is not because their muscles are tearing, but because their tendons and ligaments haven't caught up to the changes that they need to make. We actually see this a lot in people who, who not just use but abuse anabolic steroids because anabolic steroids really allow you to be able to lift a lot more very, very quickly. And so the muscles might be getting a lot stronger, but the tendons and ligaments aren't caught up yet. And then you see people tearing and having big, big issues as a result result of that. Same thing often will happen with beginners who go too heavy too quickly. Get your technique down. Focus on being more comfortable and confident in the gym. Follow a great program. These are things that as a beginner you can focus on without going to failure, without lifting super, super heavy. Just on a scale of 1 to 10, difficulty should be like maybe a 5 or a 6 out of 10. And then from there, as you progress to intermediate and advanced, then you can lift heavier weight. So as a beginner, starting off light, focusing on technique, you will progressively overload just from doing that. Once you get more to an intermediate to advanced level, yes, you need to lift heavier. And there has to be sets within your training, not every set and not even every day, but within your training, there will be sets that you need to really power through, that you really need to struggle with. On a percentage scale, usually at least 75 to 85% as you become more and more advanced. I would say that's, that's anywhere after a year and a half to two years of really, really good consistent strength training. 75 to 85% of your one rep max to be enough to really, really elicit more strength and muscle adaptations. Now, you don't need to do that every single set. You shouldn't do that every single set. And sometimes you won't even need to do it every single day. But that does have to be included within your training to make sure that you are progressively overloading and that your brain and then your and your muscles are getting the stimulus they need in order to adapt so they can get stronger and get bigger. So by this point, you should have a pretty good idea of what progressive overload is and why it's important. But how do you actually do it? That's what we're gonna talk about right here. And there is a fuck ton of ways that you can progressively overload, right? There's a lot. I'm gonna go through a bunch of the ways. The first one is very simply adding more weight, okay? So let's say, I don't know, we're, gonna, we're just gonna stick with the curl, right? We're gonna stick with the curl because it's a super easy one to understand. If you can curl 20 pounds for 10 repetitions, and then you can increase from 20 to 25 pounds, for 10 repetitions, you've just progressively overloaded. Now, you what you could even do is, let's say you're doing 20 pounds for 10 reps, and then you drop the weight, and then you increase the weight to 25 pounds for six repetitions, that's still progressive overload. Even though the reps went down, the weight went up. There is still a change happening. You are lifting heavier weight. That is still progressive overload. As long as the weight is going up, you are progressively overloading. So. It is important to make sure you're following a certain repetition scheme. We're gonna talk about that with the double progression model, but adding weight, just lifting heavier weight is a form of progressive overload in and of itself. It is probably the most common and the one that most people talk about. There are many other ways to, to progressively overload as well that are equally as effective and you can often do on a more regular basis. So for example, instead of just increasing the weight, you could also increase the number of reps that you're doing with the same weight. So using the curl example, let's say instead of doing, uh, let's say you're doing 20 pound curls for 10, well, you could do 20 pound curls for 11 or 20 pound curls for 12. That's progressively overloading. And a lot of people, especially newer people, I don't think they really believe me when they hear like, so just one more rep means that like you're progressively overloading? Yes, one more rep means you are progressively overloading. So if I'm, if I'm stuck at doing 20 for 10, 20 pound curls for 10 reps, and then one day I eke out that 11th rep, I'm getting stronger. I put another, I put a significant amount of stress more on my body, more on the working muscles that is going to cause my body to adapt that will allow me to get stronger. So you know, with actually that in mind, before we go over the rest of the how to progressively overload, I wanna jump ahead to double progression because increasing weight and increasing reps are two of the best ways to do it and two of the, the easiest ways to do it from a tracking perspective. So I wanna walk you through what the double progression model is and then go back to other ways to progressively overload. So double progression is very simple. We're gonna stick with the curl, uh, the curl example here. Let's say I tell you to do three sets of eight to 10 curls, okay? I'm giving you a, range, a rep range, eight to 10 reps. I'm deliberately not saying just do eight or just do 10, I'm saying eight to 10. With this model, you start on the lower end of the rep range, okay? So let's say you're doing three sets of dumbbell curls of eight reps with 20 pounds, okay? So cool. Week one, you do eight reps of 20 pounds. Week two, you try and do 20 pounds again, stay the same weight, but instead of doing eight reps, you go to nine reps. 
Week three, stick with 20 pounds. Instead of doing nine reps, you try to go to 10 reps. Well, now you've reached the higher end range of the repetition range. So now you go from, you go from that 10 reps, you go back down to eight, but you increase the weight. So instead of doing it with eight, uh, with 20 pounds again, now you try and increase to 25 pounds. So you do three sets of eight with 25. Then next week, you try and do three sets of nine with 25. Then the next week, you try and do three sets of 10 with 25. Boom, hit that top end range, go back down to three sets of eight, and again, increase the weight to 30 pound dumbbells. This is the double progression model. This allows you to focus on both increasing weight and increasing reps, but you do it progressively over time. So, and again, this is just a very crude example of like week one, you do this, week two, you do this, week three, you do this. With a beginner, that's how it's gonna work. And e even in some movements with intermediates, once you get to advanced, an advanced level of strength, adding one rep every single week is not going to happen. Adding one rep with a, a near max amount of weight becomes excruciatingly difficult. So as you get stronger, as you add more strength and muscle mass, it becomes increasingly more difficult to eke out another rep. This is one of the reasons why when people first start strength training, they call it newbie gains. Like, it's the most fun. When you first start strength training, it's the most fun because you literally can lift more weight every single time you go to the gym. As an intermediate, it's probably not every every time. It's like, it goes, first it goes every time, then it goes from every time to every week, and then from every week to every two weeks, and then from every two weeks to every month, and then from every month to every couple of months, until at a certain point it's like, Maybe every year you're adding like five to 10 pounds to certain movements. And some movements you won't add at all. For example, lateral raises. I've been doing the same fucking weight for lateral raises for years because the moment arm is so long versus a squat or a deadlift, which is much more efficient and you have many more muscle groups that you're working. So progressive overload, not only does it change based on what muscle you're using or what exercise, but also how advanced or not advanced you are. So keep that in mind. A lot of people will lose their passion for fitness as it becomes more difficult, as they're not seeing as much progress as they once were. This is why most people don't stay with it their whole life. Or this is one reason why people say don't stay with it their whole life because the beginning was really fun. They had this huge uh, growth in the beginning phases and then it tapers off and then they're grinding and they're get working hard, but they're not seeing the same amount of growth. And that's the name of the game. The iron never lies, as Henry Rollins once said. This is, this is, it's important to understand as you continue to progressively overload, you will not be able to progressively overload as often or by as much on a consistent basis, okay? But the double progression model, having that range where every week or every two weeks or every month, you try and increase a rep here or try and increase the weight a little bit, then go back down to the bottom of that rep range is one of the absolute best ways to consistently try and progressively overload. Now, jumping back to how to progressively overload. The next one, so we have use more weight, do more reps, going down to the double progression model. Then we have, you can do another set, right? So if you're doing three sets of eight to 10, you can make it four sets of eight to 10. Now this one, I'm always hesitant to give this one out because some people are like, okay, well then I'll go to five sets, then six sets, then 10 sets. It's like, no, 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 there's, there's a limit here. There's a limit to how many sets you can add. And generally speaking for me, when I program, I program between two to four sets of any exercise. Two on the low end, four on the high end. I never go above four. And I, I shouldn't say never, I rarely, rarely go above four. And if I am going above four, it's usually with a very light weight to work on speed and explosive power, which is a topic for a separate video. If you want me to talk about that in another video, leave a comment, let me know, which actually reminds me, get, if, if you are liking this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you don't already. But if I'm doing more than four sets, it's usually a very light weight with a, a specific focus on speed and power and explosive development. Um, when you're trying to get stronger, two to four sets is absolutely plenty. But if you're doing two or three sets and you wanna add a, a just put an, another stressor on your body, you couldn't add weight that week, uh, you couldn't add more reps that week, cool, maybe add another set. And that is another way of progressively overloading because you're essentially, you're doing more work, right? You did a whole nother set with a whole uh, extra amount of reps with all that extra weight on top. So if we're looking at the equation for how much work you're getting done, you actually did a lot of extra volume, which can contribute to another uh, adaptation that your body is gonna go through. So the next way to progressively overload is doing what's called increasing time under tension, which is just a fancy way of saying, making each rep 
take a longer amount of time. So if we're gonna use the dumbbell curl example again, which Mitch was saying, are we ever gonna see you do a dumbbell curl? Maybe one day you'll see me do a dumbbell curl. Um, I actually did them last night. Anyway, I know I don't have, I don't have big biceps. Anyway, if you're doing dumbbell curls, a lot of people are just gonna do like a up, down, up, down, like one second up, one second down, right? Which is fine and it works very, very well. But if you want to increase that time under tension, maybe you're gonna do a two second up and a two second down. Or maybe you're gonna do a one second up and a three second down. There are infinite number of ways that you can increase time under tension depending on what you want to focus on. But very simply, when you increase the time under tension, you are increasing the amount of time that your working muscles are creating enough tension to lift that weight, which makes it much more difficult and is another form of progressively overloading. Because again, progressive overload is just adding another stressor onto your body, onto your working muscles, on your tendons, on your ligaments, on your neuromuscular system to allow you to make an adaptation that will allow you to get stronger. So increasing the time under tension, going from this to this to this to this, is far more difficult and it's going to allow you to progressively overload without increasing weight, without increasing reps, without doing another set. You just stress your muscles for longer for every set. If you're doing one up, one down for every set, you will have X amount of time of tension on each working muscle. But if you double that time per each rep, so from one to one to two to two, you've now doubled the amount of time that your working muscles are working throughout that set, which is another adaptation your muscles are gonna to have to go through so you can get stronger, build bigger muscles, and improve your performance. Now, the next way to progressively overload is I think probably the most overlooked way and arguably the most important, especially from just a health, longevity, and safety perspective, it's using better technique. And God knows basically every single fucking person out there needs to use better technique it's a shit show out there in the fitness world. I am seeing people using awful technique. And one of the easiest ways that people screw up technique is using momentum to do, uh, to do an exercise, right? So if going back to the bicep curl situation, if people are you know, doing this or using your hips to get the dumbbells up, you're not using your biceps, you're using your fucking hips. It's a, basically a kettlebell swing that you're using to get the dumbbells up here. If you slow it down and you actually use the muscles that are required for that movement, not extra muscles, not momentum, well, now you're gonna be overloading the muscle because before you weren't even using it very much. We see people do this with curls. I see people do this with literally every exercise. We could look at, at push-ups, we could look at chin-ups, we could look at any exercise. People are using momentum, using shitty technique, not getting a bigger enough range of motion. That's what we're gonna talk about next, but they're not using a big enough, uh, a good enough technique to elicit enough of a, of a stressor on that muscle that will result in a strength or muscle growth adaptation. So if, you're, if you don't wanna increase the weight, if you don't wanna increase the reps, if you don't want to do another set, if you don't wanna do more time under tension, perfect your technique. And every single one of us can work on that, including myself. There are times where I catch myself cheating. Focus on technique is one of the best ways to progress for the overload. It's gonna keep you safe, keep you healthy, and improve your longevity in this game of life in which after a certain point, you're like, what's the fucking point of lifting more weight outside of improving my ego? Or, or not improving my ego, but like stroking my ego. After a certain point, it's like, why not just work on getting better in that movement and use better movement, better technique, and you'll get stronger as well as a result of that. Now, the last one on this list, and there are many, many, many more ways to, to progressively overload, but the last one we're gonna leave you in this video is using a bigger range of motion. Now, there are many, many ways to do that. Uh, for example, if you're using shitty technique, and let's say you're squatting, right, and you're doing a quarter squat, right? You're, you're not going down all the way. Well, number one, that's shitty technique. And number two, you're not using a big enough range of motion. So simply reducing the weight and then going all the way down in your squat is a form of progressive overload because you are actually recruiting more muscle fibers in order to go all the way down in the squat so that then when you come back up, you are going through a full range of motion and able to progressively overload so you get that full strength adaptation. Let's use the curl example again. I see a lot of people, I see a lot of guys doing this. A lot of guys when they curl, they do this. They go down to here and then right when it gets really difficult, they send their arms back. They don't extend the arms, they just send their arms back and then they come back up. This is not a fucking dumbbell curl. This is not, this is an ego lift. If you wanna do it properly, you go all the way down, bigger range of motion, 
and then all the way up. If you're doing a squat, you go all the way down and all the way up. So yes, this goes into the previous one in terms of using better technique, but also in terms of using a bigger range of motion. It's super, super important to actually recruit as many uh, muscle fibers and motor units as possible. Now, what Mitch and I are gonna do is we're gonna overlay an image of me, a video of me here, showing how you can increase range of motion in some movements without actually needing to just use better technique. And this example is a deficit deadlift. <clears throat> and what you'll see in this video is I'm actually standing on a couple of extra plates. This has increased the range of motion by a couple of inches. It's still a deadlift, it's a regular deadlift, but I've just increased the range of motion by making me have to go down further in order to pick the bar up and deadlift more weight off the ground. So all I'm doing here I'm not lifting more weight, I'm not doing more reps, I'm not doing more sets, I'm not doing anything. I've just increased the range of motion of my deadlift so that I can recruit more muscle fibers, recruit more motor units, and I can get stronger and progressively overload just from this little bit of extra range of motion. This is one example where without needing to, to use better technique, you've actually changed the exercise to require a bigger range of motion that will also allow you to progressively overload. Now, before we get to barbell versus everything, I just wanna give a brief note. Like, like I said earlier, progressive overload works for everything in life, not just for strength training, but included within this is cardio, right? So let's say you're doing some zone two cardio. And by the way, if you haven't heard my podcast on zone two cardio, I'm gonna put them in the, the description of this video. They're super, super important, especially for your long-term health, for blood pressure, athletic performance, all of that. But let's say you're trying to improve your cardio and you start off walking on a treadmill flat, no incline, and you're walking at a speed of three. Well, one way to progressively overload that would go from three to 3.1, then from 3.1 to 3.2, and then 3.2 to 3.3, so on and so forth. You could also keep it at a speed of three, but increase the incline from zero to 0 0.5, and then from 0.5 to one, and then from one to 1 1.5. And you can, this is a double progression model on the treadmill, right? You can increase the speed, and or you can increase the incline. So you could set your own ranges. You know what, I'm gonna be between a range, a speed of three to 3.5. And uh, and then from there, once you get to 3.5, you add another, you go back down to a speed of three, but you increase the incline. This is another form of double progression just with cardio. And you can do this on a bicycle, you can do this on a rower, on an elliptical, on a stair climber, whatever the fuck you want. This is important, progressive overload doesn't just work for strength training, it works for cardio as well, and works again for everything in life. So keep that in mind. This is this is a system for improving you as a human, not just for getting stronger and building your bigger muscles. Now, let's talk about the barbell versus basically everything else. The only exception is going to be, be machines. I'll mention them at the end. But barbell versus dumbbells versus kettlebells versus everything else. Why do I love the barbell so much? Well, number one, I just, it's fucking awesome. It feels badass to let the barbell up, put some chalk on your hands, just awesome. But the barbell is actually easier to progressively overload than basically everything else, especially when you're doing big compound movements. Not so, not necessarily with isolation exercises. I'm not doing lateral raises with a, with a barbell, that's for sure. But let's look at this from a bench press perspective, okay? So let's say you're doing the bench press and you're doing a barbell bench press, right? To go from a 100 pound barbell bench press to a 105 pound barbell bench press is only a 5% increase in total weight, right? But let's say you're doing a dumbbell bench press. With the dumbbell bench press, it's significantly harder to use the same amount of weight with dumbbells because you're it's, a, it's a essentially a unilateral lift, right? It's a single arm movement. You're balancing each weight in each hand. So, but let's just say you have 50 pounds in each hand, right? If you, to go from 50 to 55 in each hand, that's a 10% increase per hand as opposed to a total of a 5% increase in both hands with the barbell. This is one of many reasons why the barbell is easier to progressively overload. Now that doesn't mean the barbell is always better. There's, there's a time and a place for both, but when you're trying to progressively overload, especially with trying to progressively overload by adding more weight, the barbell is a really, really great tool because the percentage increases will be smaller, which will allow you to add more weight over time. And they also have smaller fractional plates. So oftentimes people have half pound plates or quarter pound plates or two and a half pound plates that allow you to add little bits at a time that make progressively overloading a little bit easier. Whereas dumbbells often only go up in five pound increments. Sometimes some gyms will have two and a half pound increments 
but even then that can be difficult and most gyms don't have them. Now, the other thing here is we have machines. Like I was saying earlier, machines are a really, really good tool, especially if your goal is muscle growth, right? There's a difference between building muscle and building strength. They often go hand in hand, but they're not the same thing. And if your goal is to build bigger muscles, using machines is such a great idea. It takes away the instability component and it really does allow you to really focus on adding more weight and or more reps without having to worry about as much about the, the stability aspect as without having to worry as much about the technique aspect because you're sort of just doing whatever range of motion the machine has you in. It's generally much easier to progressively overload a machine. Now, if I'm working with someone for athletic performance, I'm not really gonna have them in machines very much. Occasionally I will, but usually I prefer free weights, barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, body weight, things like that. But if we're looking at ease of progressive overload, generally speaking, barbells and machines tend to be easier to progressively overload than dumbbells, kettlebells, all of that stuff. It doesn't make them better and I use everything. I look at dumbbells and barbells and kettlebells and bands and body weight and machines. These are all tools in a toolbox. If I have a, a, a toolbox, I don't just want a wrench in there. And I'm not a handy guy, so I don't know many other tools. Like I know there are hammers and nails and all that shit. I don't just want one wrench. I want the entire fucking toolbox, right? So if I'm programming for someone, if I'm programming in the inner circle, for example, there's all different types of movements. There's kettlebell movements, there's dumbbell movements, there's barbell movements, there's band movements, there's body weight movements, there's everything because everything has a time and a place. But specifically for progressive overload in this video, barbell and machines tend to be easier than other forms, uh, other tools within your weightlifting toolbox. All right, now we're getting to the end. We are almost at FAFP. I'm assuming you don't know what FAFP is, so stick to the end, watch the whole way through. I'm gonna explain. First, we're gonna talk about progressive overload doesn't happen every day. If you're a beginner, it does. If you're getting those newbie gains, I, I remember when I first started going to the gym and literally like day one, I was doing X amount and day two, I was doing five pounds more. And then day three, I was doing five pounds more than that. And day four, five pounds more than that. I was like, this shit is fucking awesome. Like it's super fun. It's very rewarding. Um, but sooner rather than later, the newbie gains stop. The linear progression stops and then it becomes more undulating and it becomes you know, much more looking at the trend as opposed to the daily weights. You have to understand this. I don't care if we're talking about adding more weight, adding more reps, adding more sets. I don't care if it's increasing range of motion, using better technique, time under tension, everything. I don't care what it is. You will not be able to progressively overload every single day. If not least of which is just because you're not gonna feel so great every day. Like we're talking about life. This isn't like a, a an ideal situation. You have got shit going on at work. You have shit going on with your family. You got a shitty night of sleep. You're stressed out. Who knows what the fuck you're dealing with? Maybe it's just like you're a human and you're tired one day. I'm like, cool. So you're not gonna be able to progressively overload today. That's okay. It's, it's not a failure if you don't progressively overload on a certain day or a couple of days or a week or a month at all. For example, I mean, let's say, I mean, if we're looking at progress, progressive overload in the real long term, it might be, we could look at it from a monthly or, or several month perspective, or maybe you don't increase weight or reps or anything throughout that whole month, but maybe that was the that entire three month stretch where you didn't increase weight or reps or any of that stuff. Over that total three month stretch, that's, that's the most amount of weight you've ever lifted in those three months compared to any three month stretch prior. So it actually technically is progressively overloading because in that three month stretch, the total amount of weight you lifted was more than ever before but you didn't actually increase from session to session or from there on and so on and so forth. In other instances, there'll be times where maybe you get weaker, maybe the weights go down, maybe you're having a really stressful time at work or with your spouse or whatever it is, and like you're just not able to lift more or the weights are actually going down. That's part of the game. That's part of this whole thing we're doing. It sucks and it's frustrating and it's not fun, but that's progressive overload. That's how life works. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to do it and that's okay. The thing is, and this is my message and everything, just don't fucking quit, okay? It doesn't mean it's not working if you're not progressively overloading every single day, or every single week, or every single month. It doesn't mean it's not working. It just means that your body is taking time to adapt and that after a certain point, once you get to be at a, at a higher level, it gets harder and harder and harder. Same way as, as you're losing weight, the leaner you get, the harder it gets to continue losing weight. Same thing in reverse with strength. The stronger you get, the harder it gets to continue to add weight and to get stronger. And that's why those like individual reps, like doing a, one more rep or using a little bit better technique, 
these small forms of progressive overload are so important to keep in mind because on the big picture, you might be thinking, oh my God, I'm really not progressing. But when you look at these small little details, when you look for the ways you've progressed with the overloaded, it makes the process so much more enjoyable. All right, last point of the video, FAFP. FAFP, it's a little bit hard to say. Say that five times fast, FAFP, 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 FAFP. Very difficult. It's the most fucking important. It is the most important of all of this, all right? And I'm not exaggerating. Follow a fucking program. For the love of God, follow a fucking program. FAFP it up. Okay, faff bit the fuck up, follow a fucking program. I see so many people doing Instagram swipe workouts and I'll just do this workout today and that workout today. If you aren't following a program every single week over and over and over and over, how can you progressively overload? You're not tracking what you're lifting in any individual lift. So if one week you're doing dumbbell flat bench bench press and the next week you're doing overhead press and the next week you're doing push ups, and it's like, you're not progressively overloading because you're doing different movements every time. The benefit, one of the many benefits of following a fucking program of FAFBing it is you do the same movements every week for between four to 12 weeks, depending on the program, depending on your level. I'll talk about that in a second. You follow a program, you track it, and then week one, you do this amount of weight. Week two, you do this amount of weight. Week three, you do this amount of weight. Week four, you do this amount of reps with that weight. Week five, you do this amount of reps. Week six, you, and you can progress and you track, you deliberately track your progress every single week with the same movements. And a lot of people are like, oh, that's boring. Yeah, it is sort of fucking boring, to be honest with you. Weightlifting can be really boring, which is why you need to find ways to make it interesting. Do the form of exercise that you love or love the most or hate the least at the very least, but focus on the, like, for example, I hate, and when I say this, like I, I fucking hate bodybuilding style training. I hate it, like I hate it. Not for anyone else, but for me. There is nothing more boring and monotonous than going to the gym and doing movements for the pure sole focus of trying to get bigger muscles. I know a lot of people love that. As you can tell, <laughs> I don't. I just, I don't enjoy it. I love strength training. I love trying to get stronger. I love challenging my body to perform better. That's what I love. So for me, it is way more motivational and fun for me to follow a fucking program to FAFP around strength and performance, to watch my deadlift increase, to watch my weighted chin up increase, to watch my push-ups improve, to watch my mile time improve, to see my flexibility improve with a real objective standards of, oh, this is where I was four weeks ago, this is where I am now. Okay, so find what works for you, find what you love, but follow a fucking program, please. It is so important, and if you aren't, you can't complain about not making progress. I wanna make this really clear. If you are not following a program consistently, and following the program as written, you can't put your own shit in there and do it, follow the program as written. If you're not doing that consistently for six months at least, over and over and over again, you can't complain about your lack of results because you're not doing the right thing. This is the most important of all. If you're not doing this, good luck with the rest. You have to follow a fucking program. You have to faff. Now, in my inner circle, I give you a new program every month, every four weeks. Let's talk about that. Why is it every four weeks, not every six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks? There's a lot. I'll start by saying this. I think beginners can follow a program for 12 weeks. If you're brand new, you follow the same program for 12 weeks. You have longer periods of time, longer stretches of time in which you can follow the same program without needing to switch anything and you can continue to progressively overload. <clears throat> intermediates, somewhere between like eight, about eight weeks or so is a good amount for intermediates. And advanced lifters, every four weeks or so you need to change. Now, it's different for different people. I know some people, even if you're advanced, they'll follow something for six, eight, 12 weeks, it's fine. But in my experience, this is what I found works best. The reason the inner circle I do it every four weeks is very simply because number one, uh, it's every month. You get a brand new strength training program every month, a comprehensive program. We have a three times a week and a four times a week. Also, I very much understand that after about four weeks, people get really tired of doing the same thing. So I wanna give them a new program because I want them to stay consistent. And we've really focused on progressively overloading every four weeks. So week one is usually a light week. Week two is a little bit heavier. Week three is a little bit heavier. Week four is super heavy. And then new program on week five, sort of over week one, light, heavy, heavier, heaviest, go back to the beginning. Now, the beginner program in the Inner Circle, the Unicorn Strong Challenge, is a 12-week program for the brand new beginners. It's a 12-week program split into three separate four-week phases. But generally speaking, you need to follow a program at least four to 12 weeks long. You need a FAFP for at least four to 12 weeks long before you switch to a new program. 
In the inner circle, I have everything for you. Every exercise there has is linked to an exercise video tutorial and not just a GIF or a GIF or whatever the fuck you call it. It is an in-depth explanation video so you know exactly what to do. You can post your own videos in the Facebook group if you want technique corrections or insight on what you're doing. It gives you everything you need every single month. If you want to sign up for that and follow that fucking program, link is in the description of this video. We would love to have you. And as always, I also pick three people every single video who comment on this video. Every single time I publish a video, I go through the comments, pick three people who left a comment to win a free month in the inner circle. So actually, that's what I think we're going to do right now. After this section, we're going to go into the other room, go into the gym, pick three winners from the previous video. If you want to be entered to win in the subsequent video, leave a comment, a relevant comment to this video, and I will pick three of you to win a free month in the inner circle so you can follow that fucking program. Or if you don't want to wait to see if you won that free month, Join, link is in the description of this video. You can start right now with the newest edition every single month, a brand new program. With that being said, I think that's probably the most comprehensive I could possibly do for progressive overload without going into like too deep on the science and boring the shit out of you. I hope you enjoyed this part of the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you don't already, and let's go into the other room. All right, so the three inner circle winners are, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Ariana Barajas, Mandy Jane, and Karen Afk, Afk, Alf, Alfke. I definitely fucked that up, but Ariana Barajas, Mandy Jane, Karen Alfke, you all win a free month in the inner circle. Email me, jordan at sciatfitness.com, and we'll set you up. All right, let's answer some Instagram questions. All right, so this first question is from Rain's Nutrition, and this is actually very relevant to what we're talking about right now. Rain's question is, I'm weight training four times per week and using progressive overload. Is it bad that I no longer feel DOMS? It's a really good question. Um, DOMS, if you don't know, it stands for delayed onset muscle soreness, which is just a very fancy way of talking about muscle soreness, right? It's the muscle soreness you feel after strength training. Uh, you don't feel it usually within the first couple of hours. It usually takes between like 48 to 72 hours is the range it will last in. Um, oftentimes like 48 hours after strength training is like the worst. Um, but what Reigns was saying is that they're training four times a week using progressive overload, just like we discussed earlier, and they're no longer feeling sore. And they want to know, is that bad? What's going on? First, I'll say, number one, it's not bad. Number two, muscle soreness is not a valid indicator of whether or not your training is effective. If you're sore, it doesn't mean the training is good. And if you're not sore, it doesn't mean the training is bad. The only way to know if your training is working is if you are getting stronger and seeing results down the road. A lot of people, they get confused with this and they'll be like, well, how do I know if my training is working then? It's like, well, how does a teacher know if her lesson plan is working? She doesn't know the same day if a teacher is teaching a class a certain lesson plan, what she'll do is she'll teach the lesson plan. There might be some questions here and there to see if it's sticking with kids, but the really only way she'll know if it's actually working is once the kids take an exam on that material. And then if the kids don't do very well, if the class as a whole, as an average doesn't do well, then she knows, okay, I need to change the lesson plan because it didn't work as well as I wanted it to. Same thing with strength training. You follow a program like we spoke about for four, eight, 12 weeks, and you see, are you getting stronger? Is your mobility improving? Is your cardio improving? Are you able to run faster? Are you able to get deeper into your splits? Are you able to do more pushups? Looking at this objective data to see, is this working or not? Soreness is not relevant in that discussion. Now, what I will say is this, if you are never sore ever, then you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough in your training, and that is something to consider. If you're never sore ever, then odds are you're not training as hard as you need to in order to elicit changes, because the reality is it doesn't take that much strength or that much pushing it to get sore. So. Uh, if you're never sore, you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough, which will then not to lead, will lead to not making the results you want. On the other hand, if you're chronically sore and sore to like always nonstop sore, you're going too hard, right? So soreness can be a tool to measure like, am I, am I never going hard enough? Am I always going too hard? It's a, it's a tool to measure in that perspective, but it has nothing to do with the effectiveness of your program and whether or not it's working. Now, another thing to consider about soreness is 
when you start a new program, like day one new program, or let's say you're doing a four time a week program, it's the first week, that first week is gonna be the worst. And what I mean, the worst in terms of soreness. When you start a new program, you're doing new exercises, you're challenging your muscles in new ways, it's going to cause severe soreness relative to on week two and week three and week four and so on and so forth. So if you've been doing the same program, which is great for three, four, five, six weeks, you will not be nearly as sore on week six as you were on week one, and that's okay. It, as long as you're still using progressive overload, you're still gonna get stronger and see results regardless of the soreness. Once you start a new program, you're gonna get sore again as long as you're pushing yourself hard enough. So don't use soreness as the metric to go by. It is very, very, uh, it, it is common. It's not bad, it's not good. It's just, it's sometimes what happens after lifting. Use your actual progress in terms of strength, in terms of mobility, in terms of cardio, in terms of physical uh, objective improvements in the gym. Use that to determine whether or not things are effective or if you need to make a change. Soreness is not that marker that is gonna tell you whether or not it's working. Okay, so the next question, the final question of this video, which actually before I get into it, if you don't follow me on Instagram, you can do that here at Site Fitness. I do at least two questions from my Instagram Q and A's on YouTube every single week. So if you wanna ask a question and have me answer it on YouTube, put it in my Q and A's that I put in all the time on my Instagram. Again, Site Fitness, follow me right now. Um, okay, so Joe 8 said, I really struggle to know how to best eat before morning, 6 a.m. workouts. Help, suggestions. Okay, this is a very common question. It's a really good question. How are you supposed to eat, especially if an early morning workout? Now, what I'll start by saying is, you don't need to eat if you're working out very early in the morning. Personally, I don't eat before I do a morning workout and I do jujitsu, right? So like my jujitsu is at like 10 or 11 a.m. And often if I'm gonna do jujitsu at 10 or 11, I'm not gonna eat before because the last thing I wanna do is train and have someone smash my stomach when I've got a belly full of food. Like that would suck. Same thing goes for strength training. If you're working out four, five, six, seven, eight a.m. in the morning, then I said 8 a.m. in the morning, it is very redundant. But either way, if you're working out in the morning, you don't need to eat beforehand. There are a couple of options. First, you could have a big dinner the night before. Big dinner focused on protein and carbohydrates are the most important things that you're gonna want. Now, if you have a big dinner the night before, there's a chance that you'll still be having amino acids run through your bloodstream and still be getting those throughout the workout. But even if you're not, it's not that big of a deal. The most important in terms of nutrition for your progress for strength training is going to be your total daily protein and energy intake, total daily protein and calorie intake, okay? So regardless of whether or not you eat before an early morning workout, as long as you're getting enough calories and enough protein by the end of the day, you're gonna be fine. Now, if you are a high level elite bodybuilder, then yes, these little things are gonna make like minute differences, in which case, yeah, it might make sense, hey, like you're gonna force yourself to eat. But then again, if you're that high level of a bodybuilder, your life probably revolves around it and you're gonna work out whenever the fuck you wanna work out because that's your life. If you're not making this, if this isn't your life, if your income isn't dependent on this, the, the minute differences are not gonna make a huge deal, okay? So that's number one, you could eat a big meal the night before. On the other hand, what you could do, and this is generally what I would prefer to do if I was doing strength training, early in the morning, if I was doing strength training early in the morning, I, I wouldn't have a big breakfast because that would suck having a huge like bowl of stomach and big breakfast, but I would take a protein shake and I'd just put it in water, a whey protein shake and put it in water, shake it up or almond milk. And I would have that and I would sip on that throughout the workout, right? I wouldn't necessarily have to chug it before. If you want to have it before, you're welcome to, but I would just sip it throughout the workout. So I'm getting a steady stream of amino acids during the workout. It's not really overly filling. It's not gonna, It's just like drinking water because it's in water or almond milk. It's very, very light. It's not a casein protein, which is a little bit thicker, which might make you a little bit more full. Whey, a faster digesting, very easy to digest protein. It's gonna be super easy for you to have during the workout. That is another option that works equally as well. If you don't wanna do that, you could have BCAAs during the workout as well. Um, I think it's sort of a waste of money it's like you don't really need them as long as you're getting enough protein throughout the day. So I would either go big meal the night before or sip on protein during the workout. And then also making sure within about two and a half to three hours, you have a pretty big window, within about two and a half to three hours, trying to get a big protein filled meal in after that as well. So if you're working out at 6 a.m., then probably by like nine or 10 a.m., being able to have a big, big, big meal with a lot of protein is gonna be super beneficial. But again, the most important, 
total energy intake, total calorie intake at the end of the day, and total protein intake. As long as you're hitting that, you're gonna be good. So keep that in mind, I hope it was helpful. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you don't already. And remember, if you want to win a free month in the Inner Circle, leave a relevant comment to this video and I will pick three new winners every single week. All right, have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon.